So before I begin, an odd technical question. Can people actually hear me? I was having a little bit difficult time hearing over the rain. Is it audible? Can you hear? Okay. As ordinary people in a fallen and broken world, we should know that things will be difficult for us here. And then as Christians in the world, the Bible tells us that things will be yet again just a little bit more difficult for us because of whose name we bear here. We're going to have a lot of trouble and tribulation as the normal course of events on the way home to heaven. That's what we should expect. But then sometimes things are different, like they are now. The big news items of January, if you can remember back several lifetimes ago to January, were big. The continent of Australia was on fire, and we were at tension with Iran that looked like war, and the president was impeached and on trial. And then we heard about the coronavirus. There's no need to recount all of that, the health crisis and the resulting economic crisis that has impacted all of us. It seems like we've talked about nothing but that since then until last week, when the entire nation began to talk about, and many even march in protest, across the country related to issues of race sparked by the tragic death of George Floyd. These are massive events, great troubles, overwhelming on the national and evil, even on the local stage, so overwhelming that other otherwise great events as in large, not good. We had a, a local police officer killed in the line of duty, seemingly forgotten until just yesterday at his funeral. Because there are so many big things going on, huge things going on on the national level. It dwarfs everything else. There's just too much to go on, going on to, to be focused. We are living through history. We really are. These are unusual, layered, big, hard things that just five months ago were not even on our radar. But here they are. Things could get worse for sure, and in history they have been worse, but this is all us right now, and it is historically outside the norm, especially because it's all happening all at once, event on top of event. And so it would be wise for us to stop, kind of sit down and, and think about this and ask, what's going on here? What am I to do with this? What are we to do with this? What are we to make of all of these events? And that kind of paused attention brings us to the same place where the book of the prophet Joel begins. Joel is one of the so-called minor prophets of the Old Testament because the book is small. Not because he's less important, just the book is small. We're going to cover the whole thing in three weeks, looking at a, a chapter and a half today. It's, it's, it's pretty short. That makes it difficult to find in the Bible. If you're looking for it, it's, in my Bible, it's about 20 or 25 pages before the end of the Old Testament, right before the, the book of Hosea. And as you turn there with me, you'll see in verse 1, we don't know anything about this prophet, we don't know anything about his lineage, we don't know anything about his time frame, we don't know much about anything except the context. A catastrophe that right off in verse 2, the leaders are called to listen and think about. An unprecedented plague of locusts has come upon the people. Now, Joel being an Old Testament prophet He's writing at a time when the spiritual people of God were also a defined political nation. They're one and the same. That's not the case anymore in the New Testament times. The United States and the people of God are two distinct entities. It's important we keep that in mind. The United States and the people of God are, are distinct, but, but we are the people of God in the United States. And so the things that happen in this country do affect us and are being used by God 
on us, in us, in similar ways to what we're going to read about here. So we need to keep that in mind as we read. And, and of course, anybody who's reading along or listening along who's not a part of the people of God can read this and realize something about God and his dealings with people. There are many things to learn here. And, of course, the invitation is always come join us. Become a Christian. And what you'll find here then is that this is for you and then the promises and the good contained in it can be for you also. But as I read, when I see things like we and us, that's the people of God, not, not the United States. It's us. So there's a lot of verses here in this chapter and a half. I'm not going to read every single one of them, but I will read some and then skip through some others. Let's begin in Joel chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 2 to 12 to start. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep. And wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree, it is stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O wine dressers, vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Locusts. They're like very large grasshoppers, and they're always around. But sometimes conditions are just right such that billions of them hatch and then swarm together, and it is terrifying. Masses of them can ride high on the wind and like a cloud blot out the sun. And they come down onto the earth. They rest on it like a dark blanket, and they eat and clip and chew up and tear apart every living plant. And then when they finally die off, they are such a substantial pile of dead flesh, I mean, this is a sizable bug in billions of them, that they rot and stink and poison the air and the water, and people die from that. When this happens, as is happening in Joel's day right around him, it's a stunning event. These verses are laced with emotional words of a lot of pain. People weep and wail and lament, and mourn, and feel shame. All of it summarized in verse 12. Gladness has dried up from the children of man. And in case we don't get that, just glance down and keep following verse 13. The priests are in sackcloth lamenting as the prescribed worship patterns that they're gone. There's nothing to offer anymore. They're supposed to lead celebrations, and they're leading instead in sorrow. In verse 16, there's joyness, joy and gladness that's gone, and there's no celebrating and no feasting, and even the beasts groan in verse 18, perplexed and suffering. All the food is gone, and there are insects just everywhere. Billions of them everywhere. Whew. Chapter 2, verse 1. The same thing described now in a different way. Like an invading army come to destroy. 
Sound the trumpet, verse 2, a day of darkness and gloom. You can just picture the cloud creating darkness over the land. A powerful people like never before. This is unprecedented and will be unequaled in the future. And onward they march, verse 3. In front of them is Eden, and behind them a desert wasteland, devoured. The rumbling, verse 5, of their wings. People say you can hear this and it sounds like a truck or a jet engine because of all the flying. And the crackling of billions of jaws as they devour the stubble. Verse 6, before them everyone is in anguish because they are coming on and marching on and up and around and over and through everything. You can't stop them and you can't keep them out. They get to it all and they destroy it. Now look at verse 10. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. This is an upheaval of life, cataclysmic. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? A massive plague of locusts. We haven't had that happen to us yet. You're still young. But just like many of the Psalms, We have some idea what's going on, but we don't know enough of the details to make it so specific as to where and when. We just see something that's happened that has affected all of life. And that enables us to connect our own selves and our own experiences and our own events to this, to what's going on here. And the connection point to us is in this phrase, Day of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 15, the day of the Lord is near. Chapter 2, verse 1, the day of the Lord is coming, it's near. We just read verse 11, the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? This locust plague is part of a larger theological concept called the day of the Lord. And that's the kind of the plug-in point for us to connect ourselves to what's going on in this book here too. And that's what's going to be at the heart of our first observation. I'm just going to make two observations. Here's the first. The day of the Lord is a period of upheaval and great distress that God brings for a purpose. The day of the Lord is a period of upheaval and great distress that God brings for a purpose. The day of the Lord, or God's day, we might say, is in opposition to man's day or humankind's day. When it's humankind's day, people largely have their way and do their thing. We kind of muddle through and we carry on planting and harvesting and working and studying and playing and marrying and so on, and and things all run one way. The tide goes one way. It goes out and it goes out and it goes out and it goes out and the beach gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the sand gets nice and fluffy and we can play in it and rest in it and sun in it and build sandcastles and the beach just always gets bigger and it always grows and we're at ease and everything is just great, right? Right? during the day of man. But there's another day coming when the tide turns and it comes in. His day. 
That's the teaching of the Bible everywhere. And so probably, you're, you, probably you've heard something about this and a little bit familiar with it. And if you have, you've probably thought of that phrase or that concept of the day of the Lord and identified it with the day of final judgment. The last day. And that actually shows up in Joel chapter 3. We'll come to that. Where we see the Lord roaring from Zion to judge all the nations in final decision. The great day of the Lord, also called the last days. And that, that's coming, probably familiar with that day. But what we're seeing here in, in the beginning part of the book of Joel is that it's actually fair and actually quite appropriate to think of what we might call minor days of the Lord. Small days. Only minor because when they stand in comparison to the final day, they are less, but they are not insignificant in themselves. They model something, they, they forecast the great day that's coming, but in this minor day, like what we're seeing here, something of a turning of the tide happens and something of, a, of an upheaval and something of a wiping away it, it, that is uniquely, it's not the ordinary troubles of, of our usual days, it's a day. When things turn and are wiped away. Now, minor in that the tide will go out again. This isn't final. It's not absolute. And minor in the sense that it's usually localized. It's some people in some place rather than universal over the whole world. There's, there's a great day, and before that, kind of pointing their fingers forward at that gray day, there are minor days, there are smaller days of the Lord. Before it, a locust plague, a pandemic, economic recession, racial justice upheaval, a day, which we can look at and say, I, I know how that came about. It, there are observable, natural the biological, scientific, sociological, emotional roots and causes that. I know where the coronavirus came from, and I understand how the economics all worked out, and certainly we understand something of, of systems and hearts and peoples and whatnot that, that create tension between human beings. We, we can see all of that, and yes, indeed, those things in a real sense caused the events we live in. But we have to then say, one step back, actually, God did it. God brought this day. It's his day in which he's working his purposes. Through all of those other means, for sure, yes, absolutely. And where there's human sin in them, he will judge that, absolutely. Absolutely. But through all of the ordinary workings of the natural order, God is exercising his purpose and his will. Ephesians 1.11, for instance, tells us that clearly, that God counsels himself what to do, and then he does it in all the earth. He reigns. If we think that through carefully in the Bible, we, we see that he is the one who controls all events and brings about all things. We see that in the Bible but it's important that we see it in this passage itself. Look at chapter 2 again, closely at verse 11. The locusts are not random. We could study how they hatched and why they do what they do. But the locusts are not a random event. They belong to him. The Lord utters his voice before his army, and they carry out his word. They are the Lord's locusts that he's brought, and his will is being done. Nothing in all of the earth and nothing in any one of the days of the Lord, whether it be locusts or coronavirus or whatever, Nothing is outside of his control. His will is being done. We have to understand that carefully, for sure. There's a lot of deep water right there, for sure. If that kind of unsettles you, you need to talk more about that later, I would, I would love to. But 
But this morning, right now, what we have to see is God is doing something. Stuff doesn't just happen. God brings it. Using it in all kinds of different ways, a thousand ways, and we'll never know all of them. But it is wise for us to sit before something like this and say, this is unusual. You have my attention. What's going on? Why have you brought this, Lord? I won't know everything, but do you want to say something to me? Is there something that you have for me here or for us here? To sit before it and say, here is the Lord's day. What is he doing and what is he saying and what's in it and why? Are you sitting there right now with this? Kind of full attention, ears open, speak. I'm listening. If so, then here's the second observation. Such great troubles come for a thousand reasons, but in part what I'm saying from this passage, such great troubles come to awaken us to dependent prayer and true repentance. Such great troubles come to awaken us to dependent prayer and true repentance. Two related, I mean, they're, they're pretty close. They're related, but they are slightly different outcomes here in this passage. And each of us, every single one of us, needs to sit before these and, and consider them and think about them. Because one or the other of them, or both of them together, or perhaps in slightly different proportions, they may apply to you. So it's worth thinking about. And to do that, let, let me just kind of like give away, the, give away the end here at the beginning, is that this is actually God's goodness to us. It's, it's hard to believe that, hard to kind of embrace it because you see, if you look out, you see destruction and all kinds of frightening stuff and you say, the locusts are destroying us and this is going to be years worth of destruction. I, I fear that. I, I want nothing to do with that. And it's hard to kind of step into that and say, okay, there's some good from God in this, but step into it. Sit, sit in front of this and believe that, that, that God who is yours, who's your God, he's in this to do you good, to do us good. So kind of let down your guard and say, okay, I'm, I'm willing, what's here for me? And when we say that, we, we ask, I think he puts two things in front. I'm trying to awaken something here. I'm calling it dependent prayer. And something here I'm calling it true repentance, both of which would be good for us. So dependent prayer first. Let's look at that. Look, in the first telling of this through chapter 1, one effect we notice is that the day of the Lord has turned life totally upside down. I'm using the word upheaval. Things don't work like they usually do. Planted fields are empty. Trees are barren. A bride's mourning a death. Priests who dress for glory and celebration are dressed for mourning with, with no offerings to, to lift up. Animals wander around the field looking for the grass that usually grows, and it's not there. And none of this can be stopped. We can't right the ship. God has brought something that has unsettled the world and broken up usual life, and he's sending that to speak to us in, in kind of a, a cage-rattling, alerting, awakening way. We are frail people. Far more vulnerable than we like to think. We are accustomed, especially in the United States, to getting up in the morning and kind of going about life in our usual basic way. We do this and then we do this and certainly things don't work out, things fail but then we also know that, that when things don't work out, I know what to do next. I've got some sort of a, back, a backstop against that, 
When, when I get hurt, I go here. When I run into this shortage, I go there. We've got a functioning society in which we have a whole lot of mechanisms and a whole lot of resources to kind of keep things on plan, keep things on path. And when we face difficulties, we are most accustomed to say, we got this. Life in the United States. We got this. This is hard, but okay. Until we don't. We realize something in, in that moment where we, for a minute, just kind of feel it run through. Whoa, there's a limit. There's a weakness there. And I'm not immediately sure which medicine to reach for to fix it all right now. I'm not sure how to, how to bail out this. I'm not sure which law to pass or which, which thing to put forward that make, makes everybody like each other. I, what do we do about this? I'm not quite sure. Uh-oh. Yeah. Now, being a minor day of the Lord, the tide coming in, the tide is going to go out. And watch what happens. A year from now, we're going to beat our chest and say, we got it, we fixed it, we did it. We're back. That's going to happen. That's going to happen, right? Well, the point of these minor days and the tide coming in for a moment is just to, is just to try to awaken something. The tide will go out, yep. But during the time the tide comes in, listen. We are far more frail and far more vulnerable and weak and needy, far more than we realize. And God wants us to hear, to see in this, in this glimpse, to see just a moment here of saying like, look, it didn't take very much, just a little bitty virus. And the world shut down and descended into panic. And people died and we couldn't stop it. Just a little bitty virus. God wants us to hear that and not drown it out or work harder or try to block it. Now, certainly we want to work. Certainly we want to be responsible and try to address things. But listening, addressing things while listening, God has a message here that he says, you have a need. You are a people who are dependent. You are not God's. Come together then, chapter 1, verse 14. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the leaders and everybody else. Come into God's presence and cry out to him. Verse 19. Call to him. For the fire has devoured and the trees and the fields are empty and you can't fix it. I can. You can't. Call to me. We're probably in this time, if you're anything like me, we're in this time and we're doing a whole bunch more reading about things and thinking about things and wondering about things and worrying about things and planning things and then worrying a little more. Are we praying more? Are we praying in dependent hope more? I find myself sometimes, probably not sometimes, probably many times, going to a, I commit myself to a time of prayer, and then I discover five minutes later that I'm just thinking about stuff. I'm just kind of rolling it over in my mind, what I just read and what I, what I, I haven't actually talked to God about this yet. I've been here for five minutes and I haven't prayed yet. Let alone the times I don't even like come to try to pray. Now, at other times, probably like you, I got you know, mixed results. At other times, yes, I am praying more, yes. But the point here is that one of the things he's trying to awaken in us is a sense of need and a sense of frailty and a sense of vulnerability. We are accustomed to just doubling down on our natural strengths and resources, and he's trying to say, that does not work. Come to me. I'm the one who can fix this, and he wants to fix it. 
He loves to give to his people grace and mercy in their time of need. That's one of the great privileges that he specifically bought for you in Jesus. He bought you access to himself so that you could come into his presence and say, Lord, here's my need, so that he could then say, and here's my grace and mercy. Because we need to see him as the God of grace and mercy. We tend to forget that. We tend to presume and think that the stuff that we have came from us. And he wants to remind us, actually, it came from me. It all comes from me. I'm the God of grace and mercy to you. Look. And when you forget that, I'm going to try to awaken it. For your good, for you to see me, for you to behold this good thing about me, which would be glorifying to him, of course. He loves to give. He loves to meet needs. He loves to glorify himself in the giving and the meeting of needs. And he wants to chase away all of our puny perspectives on him as the God who's just just there to forgive us of our sin, but then we meet all the rest of the needs ourselves. No, we don't actually believe that, but we kind of lurch into thinking that. And he wants to chase that away and awaken in us dependent prayer. But there's more, which is pretty close to it, but is a little bit different. Look at chapter 2, verse 12. Verse 11 ends, The great and very awesome day of the Lord. Who can endure it? God's next word, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me. with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. We saw back in chapter 1 the, the calling of this assembly and gathering together of all the people, the leaders and everybody else into his presence. Well, it's, it's here again, verses 15 and following describe it. It's not two different things. It's the same thing. It's just described differently with a little bit more detail. And what do we have here? What we have here is returning to the Lord. That's repentance. Not weeping and mourning because of the loss of the hardship and the suffering like in chapter 1, but now weeping and mourning because of the, the discovered awareness of how I have walked away from God as one of his people and gone my own way as one of his people. Grieved over that, broken of it, and now turning back in true repentance, not surface level, not just tearing the garment so that it looks like I'm repentant, but tearing my heart because I actually am broken. This sort of true repentance, that too is what God is trying to awaken in his people with such great troubles as these. To just step back for a second, like look at the, the wider, larger world, to awaken in them too. And if, if you're not a Christian here, this is, this is where it does connect to the rest of the world. As I said, I'm talking to the, the, the Christian church primarily, but there is a connection point here to the rest of the world and that we would see in this, this is something, this, little, this day that's a, a pointer for it, this is something that shows the grievousness of walking away from God and shows something of the pain when God acts to judge that, to discipline it, to address it, to change it. There's something there of sin and something there of judgment. And there's an alert then. Don't don't rest there. Come to him in the way that he says, I want to be gracious and merciful. I want to show steadfast love. Come to him in the way that he says he does that in Christ. There is indeed a way. Jesus, come. So there's something something there that is that is for the 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 mass of people that are out there, but this is really spoken to the minority of people who are in here, to those of us who call ourselves by his name already. 
we too are supposed to see in the events of the day something of the grievousness of the sin of walking away from him and something of the vigor and the pain comes when God addresses it. And to turn then, repent. To be warned and alerted and to turn. God's trying to awaken that among his people, which is why I said that all of us need to think about this carefully. Because that does not, that sentence does not sit universally the same on every single person. If you think about this, presumably, some in Israel at the moment, when Joel wrote this, these things happened, some were presumably walking with God in beautiful, good ways. The prophet Joel himself, for one, evidently, was close with the Lord. But also, evidently, in the larger corporate sense, some large number of them were not. And it doesn't say what the problem exactly was. Unlike most prophets, there's actually no direct declaration of their sin in this book. It kind of leaves it vague, which again is very helpful because we can kind of plug ourselves right in there. Clearly, in some way, the bulk of God's people were not where they needed to be with the Lord. Hence, these verses, a call to come back. And, and so then, that's where we all sit there and say, I need to hear this myself and repent wisely as is befitting of me and us. Everybody is gathered here, children and nursing infants as well. Everybody comes. So all of us can come before the Lord and can engage on this point and, and, and hear this and sit under this call to, to repent and to turn. And certainly then every single one of us as we sit there, certainly we can come up with something where as I listen and I think and I see in this your concern over sin, what would you say to me about that? I, none of us can say, nothing. I'm good. None of us can say that. All of us, I certainly come up with things. I sit before the Lord, and I think, and I realize, there's where I've become too comfortable with independence from God. There's where I see my my alertness and my, my trust of him, my faith, my obedience lacking. And there's where I repent. And there's where you repent, whatever it is for you exactly. In all different ways, to all different degrees, God is attempting to awaken in each one of his people by showing something of the seriousness of sin and the ramifications in his reaction to it to awaken in all of us true repentance, a turning back to him in heart, not on the surface, in heart. To purify his church, purify our relationship with him, Whatever that may mean, as you work through verses 12 to 14 for yourself, what does he say to you? Ask him. And sit quietly and listen. And repent. Return to the Lord. Knowing that he has made a clear way and that that's where your life is found. We are a people made to live dependent on him. It, it is one of the, uh, the abiding, unfortunate aspects of our flesh. As we walk through life, we still tend to cringe in shame when we see our sin. And God points it out not to. Do you notice the, the connection between 11 and 12? God brings a locust not to... He brings a locust to say, even now, turn back. 
He brings a locust to turn us, not to crush us. One of the unfortunate aspects of our flesh is that we still cringe in shame when we should say, there I am. Lord, help in dependent prayer. I turn back to you in true repentance. I want to walk with you in purity and righteousness and holiness. I want to stand in justice and in mercy. I want to know your grace. I want to experience your steadfast love that you made for me, you made available for me in Christ, and I'm stepping away from bring me back, please. We should talk like that and interact like that with God. And not, no, 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 no. Here I am. It is humbling. It is perhaps first step embarrassing, but it is life-giving and releasing. And that's why he goes to the trouble to awaken his church, to release us and give us life, to release you and give you life. So return to the Lord. Look around and see this and say, what's going on? And here in it, I'm calling to you. Come, 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 come. Find life and find help for me in your moment of need. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'm going to give you rest. Come. And what we'll find is far greater assurance than the opening of verse 14. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? Who knows? We know. Because Christ has promised. Not that he will change every circumstance, but that he will leave a blessing behind on us, his his blessed, beloved ones. Turn and come back in true-hearted repentance, crying out to the Lord, and you will find him good. Let's pray. Father, would you please draw each of us? We are each in different places and different moments. So would you please address each single one of us carefully and wisely and powerfully and draw us back, please. You are a God of steadfast love and mercy. You're gracious kind so would you please minister to us your people and purify us and draw us to you will you please work in all of this land pursue other people too please Lord with events like these and show them that there is only one hope you awaken them as well people here and there and everywhere But particularly, Lord, I pray for us here. Would you awaken us and draw us to you? Grow us up in you. Thank you. We love you. We trust you. Amen.